This ad is about AT&T's deal on the new iPhone 15 Pro, and it's real, guaranteed. That's not always the case with other ads. The view of a lifetime. Only with a pricey upgrade. Breathe in to find inner peace. Then pay extra to remove the ads. At AT&T, we mean what we say. Learn how to get iPhone 15 Pro with titanium on us with eligible trade-in. Guaranteed. Connecting changes everything. AT&T. See att.com slash iPhone for details about the guaranteed trade-in promo for new and existing customers. Available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that knows that the best quarterback in all of the NFL is, in fact, Jarvis Landry. Here is the captain. Yeah, but nobody has better moves than Baker Mayfield. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very excited to be featuring Shiner Holiday Cheer. And if you are a Grinch, pick up a six-pack of Cheer. Shiner brews this beer for the holidays. This is a Bavarian-style dark wheat Dunkelweizen brewed with Texas peaches and roasted pecans. Delicious. Garage grade, four out of five bottle caps. And speaking of cheer, let's spread some cheer and give out some cheers to our garage friends and supporters. First up. And overdue cheers goes out to Steph in Nederland, Colorado. Do you know what you do after a good Christmas meal? What's that? You take a good dumper bison. <laughs> and the first We Like Your Jib of 2021 goes out to Don in Anchorage, Alaska. Next up, Captain, we have Teddy Zaya in Crabtown, Maryland. And a big shout out to Ruth in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Next, Captain, we have a cheers, and this is a request, a cheers to all of the Midwest folks. So we're covering thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of wonderful people. But of those Midwest folks, that also includes Ryan Smith in Cambria in Madison, Wisconsin, Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and they helped out with this week's beer fill up the fridge. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B W E double R U N. Thanks for filling up the beer fun. It's so good to be back with our filthy animals, our true crime addicts. And if you're truly a true crime addict, you're going to need our other show called Off the Record. We do case updates every other week on stitcher premium and that is enough of the business all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime It was May 19th, 2016. Jenny Jibo was preparing to leave for work. It is about 7.45 a.m. To her surprise, her 19-year-old grandson, Logan Schindelman, who lived with her and her husband, Bill, came into the kitchen from the garage. Logan had been out all night, which was not a big surprise. He is 19 years old. 
Logan says he was out all night just driving around. Jenny thought he seemed nervous and anxious about something. He seemed to want to talk, but yet was hesitant. Something seemed to be bothering him. Finally, he said to her that he recently had an epiphany, and he used that uncommon word, epiphany. The literary definition of epiphany, a visionary moment when someone has a sudden insight or realization that changes one's understanding of themselves or their comprehension of the world. But Jenny was already running late and told Logan that the two would sit together and talk that evening when she got home from work. And so Jenny left the house. Whatever the young man had to say or get off of his chest is a mystery. We will do our best to try to track Logan's possible movements and actions since, because there would be no such conversation between Jenny and Logan after Jenny returned home from work that evening. In fact, it has now been almost five long years since her grandson told her he had an epiphany, and Jenny has not spoken to nor seen Logan since. This is True Crime Garage. Logan Drew Schindelman was born on June 27, 1996 to mom Hannah and a father that he never knew. His mom Hannah is mixed race and her mother is Jenny, who is a white woman who dated a black man who is Hannah's father. But Hannah did not have much, if any, of a relationship with her father. Hannah grew up with her mom Jenny in Tumwater, Washington about 60 miles south of Seattle and just north of Olympia. Hannah herself turned out to be a young single mom to a daughter named Chloe. When Chloe was still very young, Hannah met a young engineer visiting the country from Saudi Arabia. Hannah got pregnant, but the man had to return to his homeland, so he never met his son. His son would turn out to be Logan. It's not even certain that this man even knows that he has a son in the U.S. Logan grew up with his older sister Chloe, mom Hannah, and grandma Jenny, and stepfather Bill, who they all lived with. He had no father figure in his life except for Bill and his great uncle Mike Ware, who is married to Logan's Aunt Mary. This is Jenny's sister. Mary and Mike live not too far from the Jibo household. Eventually, at the age of 23, Hannah decided to leave her kids with her mother and move to Olympia to start art school. So the grandmother, Jenny, obtained legal guardianship of the kids so they could be on her health insurance. Hannah does not speak publicly about this case but she seems to have had a good relationship with her son, Logan, who would visit her frequently and spend the night at her place. Logan played football at Tumwater High, and he was very popular, funny, and well-liked. He played defensive back on the team, which was state champs for two of Logan's four years in high school. Things were good for Logan. He was a good-looking kid. Very athletic, very attractive young man. And he was a pretty decent student as well, this despite not really putting forth much effort into his schoolwork. This is according to his grandmother. He also liked to write poetry and was really into music. By all accounts, he was a normal teenager. After graduation in 2014, Logan intended to go to college at Eastern Washington and to room there with one of his good buddies from high school. But the summer after his senior year, Logan started to change. His friends say that he was going through something, but they didn't really know what exactly it was. Now, there is one noted incident that might clue us in on what those changes were in his life. This is when Logan was at a party 
where he had some kind of interaction with a girl that he knew, a girl that he went to school with and he knew her fairly well. This girl made some racist comments specifically about Logan at the party. Now, many people claim that the Tumwater area is an integrated town and Logan didn't stand out because he was black. But others say that the area is overwhelmingly white and that it would have been difficult for Logan to fit in at times. Yeah, and extra difficult coming from people that you thought were your friends. Well, reportedly, this incident at the party seems to be the beginning of Logan withdrawing from his group of friends, whom he must have felt did not have his back. They weren't there to defend him. They weren't there for him. This is one of those life moments that I always call, hey, you find out sometimes who your real friends are. If these guys and girls truly were his friends, they would have stood up for him in this moment. So he stopped responding to friends' messages, even though they could tell from Facebook that he had read these messages. He abruptly canceled his plans to go to the college he had committed to. Instead, he switched to Washington State University. This is a much larger and more diverse school, but this is somewhere that he would know no one going into his freshman year. Jenny, his grandmother, believes that he was going through some sort of identity crisis and possibly wanted to reinvent himself. Reportedly, he had just recently learned the truth about who his father was, a Saudi national. The timing on this and how much of a surprise it was is not clear. And Logan had recently spent some time connecting with his grandfather's side of the family. This is the African-American side of Logan's family, who later claimed that Jenny tried to keep Logan from this part of his heritage. We don't really know whether this is true. There's a little bit of drama here. That's obvious. Logan's African-American relatives say Jenny was keeping Logan from them and that Logan told them Jenny would be angry if she knew he had been in contact with them. But Jenny said that that side of the family had never exhibited any interest in Logan and that their interaction with him often quickly fizzled out. She said she was happy for Logan to interact with all of his relatives and that All of his questions about his father had been answered at that time, at the time of his disappearance. But his great aunt Tina said that Logan started posting some stuff relating to Malcolm X and other racially aware items on his social media. All in all, it sounds like Logan was struggling a bit to figure out who he was and where he belonged, both in the family and in the world. Logan went off to WSU in the fall. He made some friends. He didn't have a lot of trouble fitting in there. We know he dated at least one girl, but they broke up. Logan was not diligent about his schoolwork. And when he came home for the summer after his freshman year, he was not permitted to enroll for the following year because of poor grades. So Logan lived at home with his grandma and her husband. Jenny says that Logan had a few jobs, including working at a commercial laundry service. He also spent quite a bit of time helping his great uncle, remember this is Mike Ware, on Mike's farm. Mike Ware was a retired Thurston County Sheriff's Lieutenant who served for 37 years at this point of our timeline. Mike Ware was retired for about two years. Mike is very fond of Logan and says Logan was a hard worker who deserved the $20 an hour that Mike paid him. Jenny says that during this time, Logan seemed isolated and a little depressed, spending a lot of time in his room listening to music or watching movies, and he started smoking a lot of pot. She says it was at this point that it was making him a little paranoid. Logan seemed to mostly keep to himself. He had a talking and texting relationship with a girl in Oregon. The two met on a dating app, but the two never actually met in person. Well, this transition from high school to college is difficult on anybody, but it seems like there was extra pressure, extra weight 
on Logan's shoulders. This gives us a good amount of background information regarding Logan and his family, and it brings us up to the time when he is going to go missing. So this is on Thursday, May 19th. Jenny, his grandmother, left for work. This is after that very brief epiphany conversation. Logan was at home when Jenny left. Everything was fine when she left for work. But when she returned from work, Logan's car was gone. And going into the home, she notices he's not there as well. He didn't come home that night. And on Friday, Jenny became concerned enough to track his phone. She says this was around 11 a.m. per a post on the family's Facebook page. Quote, the AT&T locator services GPS indicated the phone, Logan's phone, was on Boulevard Road in Olympia approximately within an eight block radius of steel street where Logan's mother lives End quote. So Jenny sees this right. Captain, she's wondering where her grandson is. Yeah. It wasn't terribly unusual for him not to come home. But again, as the morning continues on, she starts to worry, tracks the phone, the old family locator, friends locator app that's on most phones sees that his phone is in the general area of where Logan's mother lives. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uncommon for him to go visit his mother. It wasn't uncommon for him to stay the night there once in a while. It doesn't sound like they had an everyday relationship though. Like, you know, it wasn't, we'll get, we'll continue to get into the family a little bit as we go through the case. But I just want to point out here, it seems to be, this is not a close family. I couldn't spot any obvious problems within the family, but it doesn't seem to be a very close family. Well, and Logan drove a black Sebring. Mm -hmm. Anybody that's a fan of The Office will know Michael Scott drove a Sebring. So it's like a convertible. By the looks of the picture, it doesn't look to be in the greatest condition, but not the worst condition. Yeah, it was a 96 Chrysler Sebring, so it would have been about 10 years old at the time that Logan went missing. Pretty standard for a college student. When Jenny sees that Logan's phone is over near his mom's house in Olympia, she says, okay, this was pretty normal stuff, so she stops worrying at this time. But Logan didn't come home that night either. And when Jenny checked in with her daughter, Hannah, Logan's mom, she said Logan never came over to the house. She hadn't seen him in a week. So now this is concerning. Jenny got in her car and drove around Tumwater looking for Logan's 96 black Chrysler Sebring convertible. She does not find the vehicle. She decided to report him missing. So Jenny drove over to the Thurston County Sheriff's Office. To her surprise, and frankly to my surprise as well, right. pardon me, I'm just some dumb guy in a garage in central Super Ohio. Super dumb. Super dumb. I've never been to Washington, always wanted to go to Washington state. So I'm not very familiar with this area, captain, Uh but she says to her surprise, the County Sheriff's office was closed on the day that she went to report her grandson missing. (laughs) I didn't know that departments closed. Yeah. 2016. I feel like crime is high enough everywhere that they just stay open. Unfortunately, we don't have enough to do. Well, they're closed. No staff was on site on this Saturday. The only way to get in touch with them would be to make a 911 call. Jenny decides for whatever reason not to do this. Right. She decided just to wait until Monday to report her grandson missing. Well, it's tough, too, because you know he's going through some stuff. And he's an adult. So there's probably been many times where he's been out partying with friends or just staying the night at a friend's house. And maybe he didn't let them know. So it's not that unusual that a 19 year old would be not seen from his parental figures for a couple days. Well, and he was away at school for a whole school year. Right. So she's used to him not being there and he's used to taking care of himself. As you said, he's an adult and a very capable one at that. Now, by the actual time and date, that Jenny reports Logan missing. This is Monday, May 23rd. Logan had not been seen nor heard from in four days. Yeah. When Jenny reported Logan missing, the detective 
in her opinion, was dismissive. The detective took down the information that Logan was missing in action and that he was last seen wearing a black windbreaker, a pair of jeans, a white shirt, and a pair of Nike shoes. Yeah, at this point, you're calling 911, you're calling hospitals, you're now talking to the police department. They're not going to seem as concerned because, again, this is this is a, a man. Yes, he's 19 years old, but he's a man. He's six foot tall. He's not an individual that's typically preyed upon. It's not like a 19-year-old female. So I could see why they're a little dismissive. Okay, you haven't seen your college age son, but I could see why they're a little dismissive of it. Yeah. And that is what's going on here. Um, he's an adult, as you pointed out, and the detective is going to remind Jenny, Hey, he could go missing if he wants to, he does not need to be accounted for or answer to anyone because he's an adult. But Jenny says that she kind of felt ignored in the whole situation One thing that the detective did before Jenny left was she asked for the license plate and the vehicle identification number for Logan's vehicle. Right. Jenny gave this information to the detective and the car was registered to Jenny and Bill Jebo. Jenny got a call that afternoon, the same afternoon that she reported Logan to be missing. When the detective ran the plates of the missing vehicle, she discovered that the car was towed by the state patrol on Friday, May 20th. Mm. Logan's car was sitting in the tow yard for several days. The captain and I have pointed this out a hundred times. Longtime listeners will know this. We always point out that vehicles seem to be much easier to locate than actual people. So great thing, great thinking by the detective there who says, give me the vehicle information because not only is this young man missing, His vehicle is missing as well. This is going to be our first major breadcrumb and to try to finding out the whereabouts of this young man. So it seems like his car was parked on the side of a highway or a road and then it was towed by the county to their tow yard. This looks like, yeah, an, an abandoned vehicle situation per law enforcement where they're going to see what appears to be an abandoned vehicle and they're going to tow it off and it's going to sit there until the owner comes to claim it. Now, Jenny is horrified to hear about Logan's vehicle. It's abandoned on the inside shoulder of Interstate 5, southbound at milepost 92, lodged against the concrete barrier in the center median. Well, yeah, we have a missing kid, but now we find his car. Maybe if it's on the side of the road, but the fact that it's in the middle, that causes a lot more concern for me. So for those that know the area The reports I have, Captain, say that the vehicle was just a little way south of the Maytown rest area, which would be about 10 miles south of Tumwater, where he lives with his grandmother. Yeah, but again, 10 miles. Look, if if it was abandoned, like maybe a, a mile or two miles away, you'd go, okay, well, something happened. Maybe his car broke down and he would have walked to us, but being 10 miles away, it's, you know, it's pretty fishy. Now, do these reports state if there was anything wrong with the car? Because normally they just tow it. They don't, like, check the engine or check to see if there's gas or anything. So two of the biggest mysteries that I could not answer when diving into this case, two of the biggest mysteries for myself, because I think that what we're going to see, and I, I know for myself anyway, that a lot of my big questions are sparked by this vehicle, by the abandonment of this vehicle, or was there foul play and somebody else moved the vehicle? Mm. So I could not figure out, I could not find somebody email us or rather more importantly, put it on the blog so everybody can read it. But was the vehicle locked when it was located? It doesn't sound like it was because it almost sounds like in some reports that possibly even one of the doors was open. Right. The other thing I couldn't figure out was like you question, was the vehicle an operating order? Was it, was it able to run? Right. Because most of the time people abandon a vehicle on the freeway out of necessity, not out of choice. Yeah, nobody wants flat to tire out no, of gas. Yeah. Nobody wants to get out and have to trek along the freeway 
or call for help on the freeway, you get off to the side. And that's the other weird thing, Captain, and you pointed this out as well. It's the center median. It's not like dangerous, right? If you could choose to get off of the freeway, you would go off to the right hand side and and try to get yourself out of harm's way. You got vehicles passing by at 60 70 75,000 mile an hour 75,000 miles 75,000 miles 75,000 miles an hour the warp speed well, that's that's cuz you're a super dumb dumb I was watching a lot of sci-fi oh, stuff okay. so. so the vehicle was found at 2 p.m. we think and I want to be clear about that this is based off of information that Jenny revealed later about Logan's phone and when calls came in regarding the abandoned vehicle. So the closest timestamp I could find of when the vehicle was located and determined to be abandoned by the sheriff's department was at 2 p.m. Well, and looking into this case, I I ended up talking to a highway patrol officer, and he was saying, yeah, maybe you could determine the time frame based on calls in, but normally what happens when there's an abandoned car is – highway patrol or sheriff or, or whoever's in that area or in charge of that area will go by, maybe make a couple marks on the window, maybe even write down a time because they want to give the person an opportunity to take care of the vehicle themselves. They usually tag it. Yeah. They normally don't tow it right away. So 2 PM, I don't know if that's a number that we can really rely on. So here's what I'm going to go with, but mind you, this is the same guy that just said, Vehicles traveling at 75,000 miles per hour. That's a fast car. That's Um, that's a fast Sebring. My general thoughts here on the time of when the vehicle would be towed, I think the calls are coming in at 2, so then you have to back that up a little bit before an officer can actually respond to the area to find the vehicle. And like you said, most of the time they're going to tag it and leave it, come back, and if it's still there, eventually tow it away. I think because it's at the center median, it's a problem for for traffic purposes, and they probably right. towed it much quicker than they traditionally would. Ken, though, this is you got to be fearful here. Look, I know when a nineteen year old girl goes missing, we talk about or or crime shows will talk about. Oh well, she was a pretty girl or whatever. But here we have this individual, Logan. He's a good looking kid. He's a he's a smart kid. He's a hard worker. This just doesn't make a lot of sense that one, you find his vehicle and he has no contact with friends or family for multiple days. We do know that calls were coming in about the vehicle at 2 p.m. The car was towed by Baker Towing and it was towed to their lot at the request of Washington State Patrol Sergeant Shades. The sergeant said that he found the car and then drove around the area to check for anyone on foot who may be the owner of the abandoned vehicle, but he did not see anyone. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Canva presents true crime of design. In the office, Maya spots something unusual in the presentation. What's this? It was an off-brand font. 
Her co-worker explains. I added the font. I thought it was fun. It was not. Maya solved it with Canva. Open up Canva, one click, and the font is on brand. Easy. Stay on brand and solve font crimes at canva.com. The home for every brand. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. All right, we're back. Cheers, you filthy animals. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers to you, Captain. Cheers to the clean animals. And cheers to the cars <laughs> driving 75,000 miles per hour. That's warp speed. Mm. The police, when they find the vehicle, they didn't search the car. And this makes total sense because they did not suspect that it was connected to any type of crime when they located it on the freeway. Their right. concern is get it off of Interstate 5. Right. But they're going to go up to the car and if there's no blood and there's no, it seems like there's no wreckage, they're not going to search the vehicle. Yeah. And there's nothing obvious in plain sight. It's not, yeah, it's not like they open up or the drugs door or, yeah. and there's like 75,000 pounds of cocaine. <laughs> right, yeah. That, that number is going to be stuck in our heads for a long time. Your fault. When the grandmother, when Logan's grandmother retrieves the vehicle after it was towed back to her home, she found that it contained Logan's cell phone, car keys, water bottle, and snacks in a large paper grocery bag. Some reports say that there were two large paper grocery bags. Mm -hmm. This bag was either sitting on the passenger seat or on the center console, depending on which news article you read. Logan's wallet containing most reports say $25. Some say $24 in cash. Mm Mm-hmm. And his wallet also contained his debit card and driver's license. The wallet was found in the glove compartment. There were other small amounts of cash, small bills and change in various spots of the interior of the vehicle, like one would expect to to find in most people's vehicles. The car's registration was in the glove box as well. But we point out these items, the cell phones particularly important, the car keys particularly important wait well, hold on i got a question so the cell phone car keys where are they found and the glove box as well i don't know be, be, and here's why the i bring up this question of the cell phone and the keys this is why i bring up this question right because if you're the person towing the car and on the passenger seat you see wallet car keys cell phone blah 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 right i'm towing the car i know it's going to sit at the lot maybe locked maybe unlocked But just as a safety measure, I'm going to open up that glove box or a center console or something and put these loose items, these important items, into the glove box. So I bring up this point because I don't necessarily think that means that Logan or somebody else put his wallet in the glove box. It could have been done by a police officer or the towing agent. Or whoever dumped the vehicle there. If it wasn't Logan that left it on on the center median at I-5. Yeah. We point out all of these items because it's important information to the case, but it's also it can also help lead you to several conclusions. The cash. If it wasn't Logan that dumped the vehicle, if it was a robbery. Why not take the cash? They would have taken the cash. A, a dumb robber would have taken the debit card as well and the cell phone. Unless... The wallet was in the glove box and they didn't know it was. They just didn't find it for whatever reason. Regardless, this is a bad, bad situation. Logan's gone and his car with all of his important personal possessions in it were found abandoned in the middle of a major interstate. 
And Jenny, his grandmother, knew that Logan loved and took a lot of pride in his vehicle. So she could not imagine him abandoning it, especially in that particular way. Yeah, the, his pride for his Sebring was just like Michael Scott's pride for his Sebring. There's some added factors in here too, Captain. Mm -hmm. It looks like from reports that I found that Logan is highly allergic to peanuts and he did not have his EpiPen with him when he went missing. Mm -hmm. The reports are unclear though. It, I couldn't figure out was the EpiPen found in his vehicle or was it something that was left at behind at home? Right. Now, after the family informed the sheriff's department of what was found in the vehicle, a detective from the Thurston County Sheriff's Office was assigned to the case and started to investigate. He came out to Jenny's house, searched the car, dusted for prints, and took photographs of the vehicle and the items that were found inside. If anything other than what we have reported was found or any prints, fingerprints of interest were lifted, we know nothing about this. There's no reports at this time about that. And I, I just want to applaud Jenny for a second, right? Raising Logan. And anytime there, there's a missing person, somebody has to step up to the plate. Not law enforcement. Somebody in the family. A friend. Somebody has to be the general, the captain, the colonel that says, hey, we have a missing loved one. We give a shit about them, and we're going to push that on to law enforcement. We're going to push that on to the community. We should keep in mind, though, that this search of the vehicle, per the family, their opinion is that this was a general and cursory search of the vehicle, that it was never really forensically processed. Right. I mean, we said that there were... Fingerprints. They looked for fingerprints, but... There was never, like, they didn't put any, they didn't apply luminol right. or comparable chemicals to try to detect blood or anything of that nature. My guess is that there's no obvious sign of a struggle inside the vehicle or outside of the vehicle. Yeah, well, and there was nobody coming forward saying, hey, I, I looked at the car myself or I smelled any kind of decay coming from the vehicle. So... Right, and we do have some eyewitnesses regarding the vehicle because we know that, that 911 was called a couple of times regarding the, the abandoned vehicle. But there was no one saying that, hey, I saw you know, guys fighting on the side of the road. Right. Investigators did take, when they came out and looked at the vehicle, they were smart enough to take Logan's computer and his cell phone, and they did search his room while they were there. We have read that a thorough forensic examination of Logan's phone was done, but this did not seem to lead investigators to Logan or his whereabouts. I think that's very key here. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know exactly what to make of that, but I know that this was done and it was done very thoroughly. And if there was a significant lead on that phone, I don't know that we're sitting here today, Captain, talking about a young man that's still missing. Well, question real quick. Is it possible that there is a lead on the phone that the police are just not telling us about? It could be. But there has been some things that took place in this case since he's gone missing that would tell me that they're at a point where they've run out of leads mm -hmm. or run out of ideas. And so... I think if maybe that phone pointed them in any direction at all early on in the investigation, that lead or those leads have dried up or they, they were just simply dead ends. So it seems to me, and I, I could be wrong, but it seems to me that the idea is that we find this car, we find the cell phone, we find the keys, we find the wallet. We do not find Logan. So it's when they find the car, this is roughly giving us a, a decent point of when he possibly went missing. Right. But here's where things get tricky because remember, this is per the phone. This is still phone information. This is from the family's fake book, Facebook page and from the Charlie project page for Logan. Both say that Jenny 
ran a family locator on Logan's phone on Friday, May 20th, and it showed that he was in the Olympia area near his mother's house. Jenny said that this was done around 11 a.m. His car was found roughly three hours later, by our calculations, sometime around 2 p.m. Right. But in an interview on ID Disappeared, the current lead detective on the case, Frank Fawley, says that they checked the cell phone records for the phone, and on Thursday night, the phone traveled southbound on I-5 down to southern Washington to the Camus area, and it spent the phone spent about 45 minutes there, then went north to Tumwater at 3, then at 3.45 a.m., the, the phone stopped moving. By May 20th, early morning, all phone activity ended, he said. He said that he believes the phone died. Again, this would be May 20th, early morning. Right. The problem with that is I, I don't, I do not know the science behind it to question Jenny's statements about running the locator at 11 a.m. Right. C- can the phone be dead and still located, still tracked GPS Right. At and the I, same time. And again, that I think that's going to vary based on model, how old the phone was, what kind of tracking service they used. Right. So I can't say if this information regarding the phone, what Jenny's saying, what the police are saying, mm-hmm. if there's inconsistencies in this information. And again, too, we, we've had several cases where the ping technology is not 100 percent. Yeah. And I, what I really want to know regarding the phone, is there any indication on that phone, be it text, phone calls, or what have you, to indicate that Logan was meeting someone, communicating with anyone? We have a lot of time that seems to go by between when Jenny last sees Logan and when the vehicle is found. We have over 24 hours between the two it's roughly 30 hours if you really want to break it down and then we have the further question of what time did logan actually go missing what time did he leave the home we know that jenny left the home she said that he was there when i left the home i have seen some reports that say that he was he was going off to work as well that day however we don't have any reports of saying he never arrived at work so was he supposed to just stay at home and he just des- he decided to leave the house at some point? There's a real lack in information here in this case. And I don't think it's because of a, a traditional situation where investigators are holding this information back. I think that this is information that people just don't know. Well, like you said, at some point he's, well, m- maybe not Logan, but maybe his phone. That's all we can say. We can't say well, we know where Logan was because we know where the phone was right? because we have no proof that Logan was with his phone. But if he was with his phone, at some point he's in an area for 45 minutes, almost seems like he's meeting up with somebody or having lunch with somebody or, or, or running an errand, but we have no evidence to tell us what that was. So my thoughts before we move on, my general thoughts. I don't think anybody gives a shit about your thoughts today. Super dumb, dumb head. Regarding the movement of of the phone. Yes. I was just joking. I because get, I, I have to believe, I think common sense is going to tell us that the phone, the movement of the phone and the vehicle are probably in sync. We know that later the phone is found inside the vehicle. Yeah. Where I see this phone moving, it's it's almost like it it's heading one direction then turns around, heads back to where it came from, and then turns back around one more time and heads back to where it just came from. These are kind of erratic, strange movements to me. It's either, it, it tells me a couple of things. Either it wasn't Logan doing a lot of that movement, or he's in a state of mind that, that is as erratic as the, the, the movement itself. Right. You know, it's almost, it would make sense if we have someone to fill in the blanks as as simple as someone saying he left, 
oh, but he had to come back about 45 minutes later because he forgot something or I forgot to give him something. Right. That's that's the type of movement that I see here. But we don't have anybody to, to fill in those blanks for us to make sense of these movements. But there are some eyewitnesses that claim that they saw his car. Yes. Yes. And this has been something that's been a little tricky because... Everything in this case seems tricky. Some reports say that there are two eyewitnesses. Some say that there are three. Some say as many as four. I think what we have here, Captain, is we probably have three or four eyewitnesses. It's just how much do law enforcement believe each one of these witnesses to be credible? Right. So let's go through the eyewitness accounts. On Wednesday after Logan had been gone for six days, Jenny contacted her sister and brother-in-law, Mike and Mary Ware, to tell them that Logan was missing. Mike, who had contacts from his days in working with the sheriff's office, spoke with the detective assigned to the case. He had very little information, but had discovered something important. A truck driver, a semi-truck driver, called 911 after seeing something on I-5 on the previous Friday. A black Sebring convertible was driving erratically, swerving, and driving too slow, according to the truck driver. Mm. No one appeared to be behind the wheel while the vehicle was moving. The car was in the slow lane the far right lane, and then pulled in onto the shoulder and stopped. The driver's side door opened and closed again. Then a man emerged from the passenger door and ran into the woods. The car, apparently in gear or left in neutral on uneven ground, rolled and drifted across three lanes of southbound traffic and came to a stop after running into the center barricade. This is where it was eventually found. Wow. Now, over the course, this witness information is crucially important, and it all comes down to the man the witness saw running into the woods. Reports are that the witness believes that the man he saw was white, Caucasian, about six feet tall, Logan was nearly six feet tall, so that fits. Biracial. But but he's not going to... I don't believe that Logan would be described by an eyewitness as Caucasian. I I actually could see it, see him being identified that way. He is a lighter-skinned black man. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying I think it's possible, but could you imagine you see this car, it's going too slow... So that makes you think the eyewitness is correct. There's nobody driving the car. It's a, it's a runaway vehicle, right? Yeah. Going too slow. Well, that would make sense because there's nobody in the driver's side to be pushing the gas pedal. Right. Or did the driver decide to go from the driver's side to the passenger side, steer off to the shoulder, and then get out? But again, why would... Logan, that has no history of behavior like this, do this. And it makes you wonder, I mean, look, everybody, not everybody, it makes you wonder what was going on. If this was Logan, what was happening? Was was he driving under the influence of possibly weed or the influence of alcohol or just impaired driving from, because he, he had several jobs that he was working. It just doesn't just doesn't make a lot of sense at all. No, it makes zero. It makes zero sense. Again, it's without somebody to fill in some of these blanks, and we don't have anybody coming forward saying that they spoke with Logan or met with him or hung out with him during this time. Without somebody to fill in some of these blanks, we we really can't make any sense of it. I don't think anybody could. Well, and let, let's go back to something too, because if this truck driver, big shout out to the truck drivers, love truck drivers, big shout out to the truck drivers. But the interesting thing here is if we knew from the towing company or law enforcement, Hey, when we came up to the car, the car was in neutral or the car was in drive or the, you know what I mean? That's a great question. And one thing I also thought about 
in regards to the vehicle itself? Like, okay, so did they leave it in drive and it was simply idling? Because we know it was traveling at a slow speed. Right. Was it idling or was it left in neutral and it's just on uneven ground and, it, and it's moving to until it stops itself? Right. Was it a stick shift in whomever was moving it or... You know, there's a there's a lot of questions about. I believe it was auto, automatic, but I could be wrong. Now, I think you might be right because one of the the family statements regarding the vehicle was that the gear shift, and I didn't want to take it as far to say that it that it was an automatic or stick shift based off of this information, but they did say that the the gear shift was pretty loose in the Sebring. You know how sometimes they can get really easy to to maneuver right over time some of them may have a button to engage them and you don't even have to use the button after a few years but the statement was that they believe that if somebody bumped it that that it moved easy enough that if you just bumped it it may you may be able to put it into a different gear well and so the thought maybe is whoever was in the passenger seat getting out of the vehicle could have bumped it that's that's a possibility what we do have here though in regards to these eyewitness or potential eyewitness accounts of this vehicle moving across lanes, it's really, this is very dangerous. We're, we're talking about a situation where several people could have crashed or had some kind of vehicle accident regarding the movement of this vehicle. What we do have is we have the detective Frawley who is currently the lead. He was not the, the lead detective initially. But he's currently the lead on the case today. He said specifically that there is only, regardless of how many people called 911 to report the vehicle, there was only one witness who saw someone actually get out of the vehicle and flee into the woods. And that where, was the truck driver. Now, do we get this drawing from the truck driver? No, we get this from a from a potential other eyewitness. We should point out that this area of Interstate 5 is not entirely rural, but is surrounded by acres upon acres of woodlands and was described by one searcher as thick and brushy. This area was searched for Logan. Now, keep in mind, he's missing for four days before they realize he's missing. So there was a six hour search using six teams utilizing both tracking and cadaver dogs that found nothing in this area. They also used heat seeking aerial technology to penetrate the thickly wooded areas surrounding the scene around where his vehicle was found and came up with nothing. I think that if something bad happened to Logan in that in the woodlands area or yeah or the immediate area of where his car was yeah i don't know how much heat on his body is going to be left five six days later i i can't tell you that but it doesn't seem like that would work for me now police did scour 911 call records and found that another call could be related to logan this call came in at 3 a.m now mind you the vehicle was found at 2 p.m This call came in at 3 a.m. on May 21st from a driver near the intersection of Case Road and Paulin Road. This is very near where Logan's vehicle was later found. The caller reported seeing a young man. (laughs) Sorry, I have to laugh. The caller reported seeing a young man who was nude from the waist down stumbling along the roadway. Oh, he saw me. The caller said that the man that they saw was possibly black, but the caller wasn't 100% sure. Right. This is apparently near an area that is frequented by crack addicts. So there doesn't seem to be. So so there's a crackhead uh, running around with no pants on, you know, doing the helicopter playing flicky flicky. And, uh, but he doesn't know for sure if he's black. We, you know, we have to report this because it is some information, but I want to be clear. There is no, there is zero evidence whatsoever that this was Logan and Jenny, his grandmother is adamant that the, that she and other family members believe that they do not believe that Logan was heavy into drugs. They do not believe that that was Logan that was spotted by this 911 caller. Well, yeah, I, 
look, we all we all know that it only takes one time. Uh, but again, I I just don't think with this kid's history, um, with his character, that this is something that, like they said, would be evidence of Logan. Well, and given what you know is in the area, what the area is kind of known for, it seems much, much more likely that it was just somebody else that was spotted. And this 911 call, somebody's calling in to report, hey, there's a man out here that you might want to come out and ask him to put some pants on. Yeah, my, my issue is how do you not know what race he is? Well, but it's by seeing his naked ass. It's Interstate 5, it's 3 a.m. in the morning, mm-hmm. and you're probably traveling between somewhere between 60 th- 60 miles an hour and 75,000 miles an hour. So, you're probably not getting that great of a look at the individual. Well, I also wonder if it's one of those millennial kids with the super tight pants on, so they thought that they were nude, but they just really had super tight pants on. Here's a little ray of hope. For the family, for Logan's family. Logan's Facebook page reported a check-in at the airport in Olympia, meaning someone's checking into a flight at the airport in Olympia. Mm -hmm. But sadly, it turned out to be a one-year-ago alert from Facebook, so not any actual activity on his page. Yeah, but this is weird to me because normally what happens, and I know you're not big into social media, but normally what happens is Facebook goes, hey, here's this memory of what happened on this day a year ago, two years ago, five years ago. Do you want to share that? You normally have to click, yes, I want to share this again. It normally doesn't just share that for you. That's interesting. So, but then I talked to a lot of people about this too. Is there's so many hackers that go into accounts, change some names, delete people's history. Could it just be a Facebook glitch? Could it be some kind of hacker on to his page? Could it be a family member or a friend or some girl that he dated for a while that knew his information and decided to log on to see if they could help find anything? But I want that's tricky because the general statement that has been put out there, and this was years after Logan went missing, is that Logan's accounts, social media accounts, have been untouched. So. It seems like a pretty blanketed statement there, but that that's the general statement that's out there. And but like you said, somebody going in there to monitor, does that trigger anything? Right. Eight months after he went missing, the sheriff's department admitted publicly that all leads had been exhausted by that time and they were out of ideas. But then Yeah, but I look I, I applaud law enforcement to do that. I am, I applaud for them to go, look, we had some leads. We followed them. They went nowhere. We need more leads. We need more help. Yes, I do. And I think that that is sparked by the possibilities because this is not a murder investigation. This is a missing persons investigation. And the sheriff's department was very open saying, look, we have no evidence to lead us to the conclusion that Logan is dead. However, we have no evidence to lead us to the conclusion that he is still alive. Right. So there is some hope if he's out there, maybe he decided to leave. Maybe he said, you know what? I've had enough. I don't know who I am. I'm looking, I'm, I'm trying to figure out who I am in this world. His, his and, family and who situation. My roots are where, where I come from, what are my roots? He may have decided to to part with his personal belongings and his vehicle and, and take off. It's, it's certainly a possibility. 13 months after he went missing, this is at the end of June of 2017, another witness came forward. They are actively looking for Logan. This isn't one of those cases that just went cold. This was a case that they were pumping out information and looking for the public's help. They were posting his picture and the sheriff's office phone number places looking for information. And this is the result, a possible lead 13 months later. 
This witness came forward who believes she had information. Now, I want to be clear here. I'm taking this with a grain of salt Mm -hmm. for reasons that I'll get into. But the family seized on this information, seeming to accept it at all face value as a legitimate sighting of Logan, likely out of desperation. The sheriff's office received a tip from a woman who says she saw Logan's car on the freeway the day that he went missing. Yeah, that's key. That's key right there. We do not know per the statements released to the public. Did this witness give us the actual date in her tip or just say, I saw his car the day he went missing. I would like to know, inquire further. Does she actually know the date of when she says that she saw this? Yeah. You want the truth, but yeah. So it's not clear And to take that a step further, it's not even clear what that means. The day he went missing, does that mean Thursday when Jenny last saw Logan or Friday when his vehicle was found? The woman told deputies that the vehicle was sitting on the right shoulder of I-5 southbound near exit 95 when she was driving to work that day. And the same vehicle was still there on her way home from work. But this time, the hood was up and there was a black male standing at the rear of the vehicle and there were two white males standing with him. She described one of the men as white, six foot tall and very thin with thin blonde hair styled in a bowl cut. He was wearing jeans that she described as way too short and a tank top that was way too small. The sheriff's office released a sketch of this man who is, is he creepy looking, Captain? Uh, duh. Pretty creepy looking. I'll post this picture on our Instagram. You can find our Instagram at True Crime Garage or go to the website, truecrimegarage.com. I'm warning you, though, as far as drawings go, this, this looks like something like out of a horror movie mm. to me. Yeah, I was um, thinking the undead. I've seen online people say that it looks like a little bit like Marilyn Manson. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm just warning you. It's like you're going to see this. Uh, it's something. It almost looks like if you had a bad dream and you're like, I was fighting this guy and he was scary looking. Well, what did he look like? This is what you would draw. So they law enforcement released this sketch of the creepy looking dude. The other man was also white with shoulder length blonde hair. He was wearing a flannel shirt and jeans, according to the witness. But the witness did not get a very good look at this second man with blonde hair. So they've not released a sketch of this other guy. So here we go again with witness sightings of Logan that could turn the whole case on its head. If this was Logan, if this is true, he was in the company of two men whom police have not been able to find. He's in the company of these two guys right before he goes missing. Right. And then if this eyewitness is true, then the car after Logan was with these two individuals, the car then moves after. Yes. Well, that's correct, but but the uh, according to the witness, she saw this in the general area of where his vehicle was eventually found. But, yes, right. given her description, the vehicle moved at some point. But I have to say, Captain, there's reason for, I believe there's reason for us to doubt that this sighting was actually Logan. One, the woman who supposedly saw him, She's speeding by on the highway. We've already talked about that. 75,000 miles per hour. Very hard to see anything at that Mm. rate of speed. Yeah. She did not know Logan either. Right. Two, this tip was reported more than a year after Logan went missing. So what convinced her in 13 months time that it was Logan that she had passed on that day? Right. Three, there is no indication whatsoever that Logan's car had any kind of vehicle trouble that I could find when it was returned to the family. I think that if it had trouble, like if it was out of gas, battery was dead, 
it was inoperable for any reason at all, I think that information would have been released. I right. think that information would have been stated outright. Yeah, it's 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 very tricky because if you're going to approach a vehicle, let's say you're just uh, you're a bad person, you're approaching a vehicle because you have something to do with Logan going missing, you could always pop the hood to make it look like you're, you know, oh, we're just taking care of this car on the side of the road, no need to stop. You right. know what I mean? So it could be some kind of ruse, but I I know that's that's going out on a, a limb. And here's the other thing. We talked about tagging the vehicle. She says that when she initially passed it, the vehicle on her way to work, it was on the right shoulder. Okay. When she comes back from work, now the hood is up. So we talked about the vehicle moving, but if it was abandoned on the right shoulder hours before it was found, you would think that maybe somebody would have called it in or police would have come by and tag the vehicle that right. was never done as well. Not to say that it has to happen, but it didn't happen. There is one man who was looked at as a possible suspect in Logan's disappearance. Mike Ware. Remember this is the uncle that employed Logan at his farm, right? Said that Logan was not happy living at his grandmother's house after he returned from college. This was because while he was at college, his sister, Chloe, her boyfriend moved in with his two kids. This was a guy named Jake and Jake and Logan did not really get along. The extent of this depends on who you talk to. Mike Ware says that they hated each other and there were fist fights between the two. Oh, fisticuffs. Grandma Jenny says that the two weren't friends but they just avoided each other and it was no big deal. Yeah, but look, if you're if you're avoiding somebody, you don't want that son of a bitch to live with you. Well, and Jake has a little bit of a history as well. He's of been course he does. convicted on some domestic violence charges from the past, pleading guilty to felony assault in a previous relationship. Uh, this is back from an incident in 2013. Now, does this Jake look like somebody that would like come crawling out of your TV? From a horror movie? No. No. Okay. It seems at the very least that he and Logan butted heads, right? At the very least, if we're going to go by Jenny, they didn't like each other, but they just avoided one another. Mm -hmm. In October of 2016, Jake from Allstate was arrested for violating his probation. I threw in the Allstate part. Right, right. The police used this as an opportunity to question him about Logan's disappearance, and they even polygraphed him at this time. The reports are that he passed the poly. Mike Ware, the uncle who spent 37 years in law enforcement, says he's publicly stated this. I'm skeptical, saying that, you know, the polygraphs can be beaten. Or it could just be not administered correctly. Correct. And of course, it's totally possible that Jake and Logan got into it on that Thursday after Jenny left for work. Something happens to Logan. And now we got a situation where we're moving a vehicle and leaving it somewhere. I, I do want to point out something here, though. If Logan met with foul play, the movement of the vehicle and where the vehicle was found makes zero sense. I get uh, let's abandon the vehicle to make it look like something happened to the young man. Right. I also get, Hey, let's, let's abandon it on the side of the road somewhere to make it look like maybe he broke down and he took off on foot and something happened to him. Then I get that having it lodged up against the, the center barricade and then have a witness who says witnesses that say they saw the vehicle moving, but no one driving the vehicle. That doesn't make any sense to me. No, but I could see we have all of Logan's items, cell phone, wallet, drive around a little bit before you abandon the vehicle. And like you said, it's that 45-minute spot that he's at. Because like you said, people go, well, he's supposed to go to work or was going to work. And we, we just don't know what that 45-minute gap was. Well, and there's no shortage of theories in this case, but 
there have been ones that I think are, are more plausible than others. And this is put forward by the uh, Thurston County Sheriff's Office that say that there's a possibility that Logan was experiencing some kind of psychotic break. In 2016, Shar- Sergeant Carla Carter of the Thurston County Sheriff's Office said, quote, we're not sure what happened, but there was some indication perhaps of some mental health issues. Logan was the age that schizophrenia and often manifest itself. And apparently latent mental illness can be spurred on by excessive marijuana use in some people. Mm -hmm. That's their statement. If Logan was having a psychotic episode, it would explain his withdrawn and erratic behavior, his paranoia, his epiphany and his bizarre disappearance. Well, and also possibly would explain this eyewitness seeing a half naked man, if, if he's going into some kind of psychosis or psychotic break, then, you know, it's very possible that that was Logan, that somebody saw half naked on the side of the road. It just seems like we would have more eyewitnesses that also saw this individual. I mean, other than the, the thick woods it doesn't seem like this is such a a desolate place that we would not find Logan. It, it it would be, I think it's possible, but yes, it was, it was searched. Now we should point out though, too, that uh, the same law enforcement agency says that another big theory that they have is that Logan is in fact still out there that he left on his own, wanted a fresh start And that's a big reason why they have been so transparent with the public with the information that they have and seeking the public's help in finding and locating this young man. We also have a situation, though, Captain, where we know his phone records. Logan's phone has been thoroughly traced and tracked by law enforcement. Some of his last texts were to his online friend or online girlfriend. They've not met in person. So I think girlfriend's a a bit of a strong label there. I agree. Her name is Carolina. And he says to her in a text, Logan says to Carolina, I don't know if I'm going to survive this week. That's one of his last texts to her. This would be right around the same time, maybe the day before he says to grandma, I've had an epiphany. Something's going on with this young man. Right. And I don't know if it's identity crisis or just not liking where he's fitting in, in this world at the time or what have you, or it's a mental break. And, and then you wouldn't know what's up and what's down. Right. And this seems to me to be two situations for a potential cry for help. We also have text messages from Jenny, the grandmother. She says she came home. Logan's not there, but the TV that would be in his bedroom was out in the family room unplugged and nothing functionally wrong with the TV. So much so, we know this to be true because she texted him, one, trying to find him, but two, in these texts that he's not responding to, says, is there something wrong with your TV? See, that's weird because, again, you could, it could be something so simple as he was moving something around or going to take it to a friend's house or or was he packing up? I mean, right. it, it's it's weird. You could put this, you could put so many different angles on this little piece of information, but I have seen stories, right? We talked earlier about the paranoia. Right. Uh, Grandma at least points out the paranoia. And a lot of people, you just chalk that up to, well, he's smoking a lot of pot. You know, people have experienced that. That's pretty common thing. But- was this paranoia, was was this the start of some kind of schizo, you know, episode? I've, I've seen situations, I've read situations of people believing that they're being listened to through electronics that are near them. Right. I don't know if schizo, I don't know if that's the correct term. It's definitely not a correct term. Um, so I, my apologies. But 
I have heard of situations where people think that that others are listening to them. Was this get right. this TV away from me kind of yeah. kind of situation? I, I and the tough thing is we only have Jenny talking about this. We don't have anybody coming forward from his work saying, "Hey, I worked with Logan and he seemed to be a little off." We don't have really anybody from his school other than this quote unquote online girlfriend saying that he might not make it through the week. I mean, that's, that's not a good sign. What we do have though, is we do have those former friends that seem to agree with the idea that Jenny puts forward that the year before the summer before Logan seems to be withdrawing from his group of friends. And of course he decides to change colleges at the last minute. We have them agreeing with that, but look. That's not that odd. No, it's and not odd at all. Especially if you're a biracial kid. Uh, regardless stru- of your regardless well, of your race, if somebody's saying race, racial racist comments to me and my friends don't have my back, I'm not their friends anymore. Right. Or maybe they were never my friends to begin with. So I don't see that as a thing. I think that what I see as a thing here, a very big problem in this case is I touched on this earlier. This is not a close family. There's some kind of drama. There's something strange with this family. And I don't mean strange as in they're bad people. There's something I can't seem to identify because I don't have enough information. But what I can say is that Mm. I've seen reports where Jenny says that Logan saw his mother between the time that that he that she last saw him and he went missing and i've seen reports where the mother says she hadn't seen him for a week before he went missing right almost like they're covering it, something up there's no unity inside this family right there's no unity there's not a united front of people coming forward and saying we know that a b c and d happened and then our loved one disappeared And that is causing problems, I believe, in our understanding of the case, as well as the investigation itself by law enforcement. Right. It's just like Jake the Snake Roberts, the the boyfriend with the two kids. Like, what's his deal? You'd think that the family would be coming out, again, united. Oh, look, yeah, he has some issues and stuff, but he wanted to do something uh, where... It would cause Logan to disappear. Well, Mike Ware, the uncle, the great uncle who Logan seems to have been close with, he says it was to the point where the guys were getting into fist fights. And then grandma says, ah, it was no big deal. Right. That's two very different stories about the same situation. The other thing, too, is Bill, her husband, Jenny's husband. There's like no mention of him in any of the stories at all. I. I, I don't I don't know why that is. It could be very simple that he's not at home very often or he, he is a non-factor in the story. But it seems like someone that he lived with, there would be something further to that story. And then what's very bizarre to me, and I don't want to sound like I'm attacking a victim, because as far as I know, Jenny is a victim. The family members are victims here in this case as well. But discovering I'm all for what she did going down to the uh, police department or the sheriff's office and filing the report in person. I always think is a hundred times greater than doing it over the phone. However, when she got there and there was no one there, there was no haste on her behalf. There was no energy put forward other than, you know what? This can wait till Monday. This can wait two more days. You could have called 911 or what I think would have made even more sense. You could have called your relative, Mike Ware, who worked for that sheriff's office for 37 years. He could have made a phone call. He could have clued you in onto what to do. There seems to be some kind of disconnect here in this family that makes me very confused about the whole situation and trying to identify what happened to this young man. Did he leave on his own? Did something happen to him? How far outside of his inner circle do we need to be looking for what could have happened to this young man? Well, again, 
a kid, a young man, good-looking young man, Logan, smart, hardworking. Yeah, maybe is struggling with some identity stuff or, or maybe just struggling with where he wants to go in life. That doesn't mean that there's a mental break. I don't know if there's enough evidence to show that he was right. having some mental break. Yes, is that part of the equation you have to look at? Of course. Should we be talking more about mental health issues? Of course. It's just strange to me. And like we were talking before, it's almost like you're looking for him, but you're not really looking for him. And it's like you call family members, you call people that he worked for. Why wasn't that done? Why, why was there, uh, there seems to be a, a lackadaisical effort on some levels and other levels. It seems like, you know, again, I'll, I got, you have to applaud the person that is spearheading the investigation as far as the family or friend level, because you have to have that spearhead that's going into law enforcement going, we need action and we need something done. Yeah. I do want to be very clear here on my thoughts and feelings, because I believe that overall the family's commitment to finding Logan has been admirable. The family was forced to take matters in their own hands. At one point, we did have the sheriff's office saying, we've run out of leads. We've run out of ideas. And so the family started the Logan Schindelman is missing Facebook page, which has over 13,000 members today. This to spread the word of his disappearance. They did hire a private investigator. They created a reward fund that has been, I believe it's $10,000. They created this reward fund through yard sales of their own and making commemorative bracelets that they sold to the public to raise this money. And some of them have even pestered local TV news channels for coverage on the case. One thing that I do find to be very interesting, and I said something just a few minutes ago, Captain, how far outside of Logan's inner circle should we be looking for answers as to what happened to this young man. I found this to be fascinating. In February of 2017, the family, Logan's family, sent letters to 37 homeowners in the Case Road area. This is near where the vehicle, Logan's vehicle, was found, asking them simply to please check their yards, their properties. These people have acres of land, 37 mm -hmm homeowners, property owners who have acreage, please check your acreage for anything suspicious, any suspicious objects, or any possible signs of Logan. I feel like the answers, I, I don't know where in fact they lie, but I think that we've, we've said where the answers could be found. We just need some, somebody to come forward and fill in the blank blanks with some more information here. Now, the case has been assigned to Detective Frank Frawley, and the family feels confident that the case is being worked by someone who cares, someone who wants to find Logan as badly as they do. If you or anyone else has any information, please call the Thurston County Sheriff's Office at 360-786-786. 5500 and we will have that phone number in today's show notes. What an interesting case. It's a fascinating case. It's truly a mystery. We want to hear your thoughts on this case. We know law enforcement checks our blogs. So any information that you have or any theories that you have would be much appreciated. You could check out our blog at truecrimegarage.com. And while you're there, sign up on the mailing list. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading 
for this week. We are recommending the snow killings inside the Oakland County Child Killer Investigation by Marnie Rich Keenan. This is our second time recommending this book, and that is because it is one of the best true crime books from 2020. So many intelligent and powerful women in the true crime community. I couldn't agree more. So check out The Snow Killings. It is well written and laid out perfectly for the reader. At times, I felt like I was reading from the investigator's case file. Check out our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com and stay tuned into True Crime Garage next week. We have an all new episode of Off the Record on Monday and a new case for you on Tuesday right here back in the garage. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't let Angie's List You Know and Trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today.